to the Canny Conversations podcast, Conversations with a Cause, with social entrepreneur Safraz Ali. Saf came relatively late to entrepreneurship after working in both the public and private sectors. He coined a phrase which describes what he does as the mad entrepreneur that's make a difference entrepreneurship. As well as being the author of the Canny Bites books, Saf's business interests cover health and social care, business and corporate events, as well as him being the CEO of Pathway Group, a welfare to work and skills provider. In these podcasts, he shares his thoughts with journalist Adrian Kibler. So let's join the conversation. Welcome to Canny Conversations with Safraz Ali. My name's Adrian Kibler. These podcasts aim to bring you a canny conversation with a cause. Conversations that we hope will captivate your curiosity cannily. And to start the series, we're going to talk about uh, the most important thing for many businesses, which is its people. We're looking at individuals within organisations. Every organisation is made up of people and they are vitally important. So when you're recruiting somebody into your business, what kind of general characteristics are you looking for? So obviously there's the individual characteristics in terms of what the person has and the traits that they have, but there's also much more in terms of what the role is. Uh, you know, we do look at the element of what that person can stretch into, what their potential is. Is the person coachable? What their hunger level is? You have some people that you know want to conquer the world, but it, but one step at a time. And then you've got other people who've got a lot more potential, but maybe lack confidence. Um, you know, I'll give you an example where we had an individual who, uh, from a, a data perspective, from a analytical perspective, he was he he didn't know the skills that he had. But you know he, you know he was going for jobs more administration based, more more sort of clerical, I would say, and uh, call center type uh, positions where really his skill sets were more data analytical, analyzing, interpreting interpreting that data, and it was a, a whiz with regard to uh, really picking these things up uh, very very quickly. Uh, his critical skills, the analytical skills, his ability to reason uh, and look at that and form patterns within that, trends, look for trends, and then be in a position to communicate that as well. And uh, we picked that up via um, obviously having sessions with the individual, what their plans were, personal development plans, looking at their strengths, looking at areas that they were comfortable with, and we played to the strengths. So if you can find somebody's individual strengths and you can look at enhancing that, that's what we try and focus on. And that's the key here for me in terms of actually what, person rather than focusing on their weaknesses or trying to overcome their weaknesses or and spending more time on those areas where there's a room for development you're focusing on and getting them to be better at their 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 strengths i guess your starting point is whether the person has what's required to do the job that you're looking to fill i mean that's a given i guess is it so yeah, I mean, can the person do the job? That's the first thing. What is it? What What is it specifically that you need within your business? You know, is this a, is this a requirement that you have, or is this? What is? is are you looking for some people that could go into? Uh, is this potential? You know, and you know, if you're a growing organization, you know, you might have uh, one key area, but you're looking at individuals that can pick up other areas. But what is that one or two areas that? You know that you you really need that person to 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 fill in. So you really look at look at their knowledge, their skills, and their behaviours. So these are the three things: KSB, knowledge, skills, and their behaviours. And obviously, you know what do you want that person really to focus on within your organisation? One of the things that, that you've talked about before. Um, which I think people will find interesting and would like to to understand that what what's behind it is. Uh, you're not, I think it would be fair to say, someone who um, perhaps puts as much score on experience as, uh, as some people do. Uh, wh- why is that? What, what what's the thought process behind that? Yeah, I mean that that sometimes gets me into trouble because, particularly with people who've 
you know, who've got many years experience and that's the word that, you know, I look at and I say, okay, but how much of that experience now is relevant? Uh, so, you know, we're in the world of digital. So if somebody, you know, even in, in terms of broadcasting now, if somebody was in broadcasting 20 years or 30 years, if they're not kept up to date with, with that, if they have not kept their skills relevant, and if they're not in a position to, you know, keep learning, keep growing, you know, when in the world of lifelong learning, how much of that experience is actually relevant and adaptable to the current world and how much of that they can bring to the table. You know, you can't quantify somebody's experience to say just because they've got 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, they're better than somebody who's uh, maybe has less because it's, it's their ability to react, to adapt to learn to learn and sometimes learn to unlearn and relearn these things which is which is key so sometimes what happens is because we've got some some views from the past some knowledge from the past we find that we're in a position that it's harder for us to le- learn uh, new ways because we can't let go of the past so that's that's a key thing for me so i'm not knocking experience no. i refer that to as a wisdom so wisdom and experience are, are, in my eyes, two different things. So experience, uh, yes, it's it, what that experience gives you. Wisdom is your knowledge that's adaptable. Um, and, uh, you know, within, the, within, within my team, I, somebody asked me, you know, what, what do you mean by wisdom? And I said, well, the difference between wisdom and knowledge is that knowledge, you know, for, so as an example, you know, a, a tomato is a fruit, and you know, you know, but you from wisdom tells you that it doesn't go in a fruit salad. That, that's how I try and my funny way of of describing it. But uh, uh, you know, yeah, wisdom, their ability to react, to change, keep themselves relevant. That's a key word that I I, I, I tend to use as well, and and their hunger to really move forward rather than relying too much on what they've done in the past, telling us stories about some of their successes, what they've, they've achieved, because it doesn't necessarily mean the fact that they're going to be the right person for, for now and for your team. I mean, you raise a very interesting point when you talk about not only the ability to learn, but in some cases the, the baggage that too much experience can bring. I mean, there's a, there's a saying, isn't there, that you, you can't teach an old dog new tricks and 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 i think you can teach an old dog new tricks what i think is much more difficult is getting the dog to unlearn the old tricks that they've picked up so to some extent i suppose if you take somebody fairly fresh or, or then it's easier perhaps to mold them and to to shape them uh, in in a way that meets meets the the the, the culture of your business uh, so not having baggage that's important you think I think you know, which which we've, we've touched on this as well as well, uh, and 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 for me, it's that ability to learn to learn, which is key. And uh, I, you know, I go, I go back to this uh, quotation, and I'm going off memory here, but Alvin Toffler, you know, he said the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn and learn and relearn. But what does that mean for us? That basically means that, you know, how we learn is going to be important. I mean, we've probably all done it. We sometimes tend to learn at the point of what when we need it. You know, we live in a knowledge economy. Knowledge is fairly easy. We can Google things. We can YouTube things. We can go and learn at, say, 11 o'clock and apply at 12 o'clock. So if knowledge is at our fingertips, we live in an on-demand economy, on-demand knowledge as well. You know, we're used to, you know, living in an on-demand world. So Netflix, you know, what if you want to watch a particular program, we can watch it at a particular time. So very similar to that, it's easily available. So it's your ability know how to use that your ability to go and find it is is the key and and for me it's that's important i mean there was a model um you know we were taught this back in the day which was a, a learning model which basically said it was a 70 20 10 learning model which was basically the 70 percent uh, of your learning comes from experience uh, which is basically sitting with nelly's that's like you know doing hands-on you know, going deep dive and actually doing things. 20% comes from learning from others, you know, from from their experience. So that could be somebody guiding you, advising you and so forth. And then 10% comes from structured courses, um, you know, reading textbooks or, uh, you know, those sort of things. For me, that slightly has changed. 
So I, you know, I so saw again within, within our workplace, we 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 cha- we've changed that from rather than seventy twenty ten, we call it forty forty forty. So doing it is is absolutely important, but also working with somebody who has who's probably ahead of the curve from you. So you know we you know we can learn from people who've done that before. So it's not necessarily the experience in terms of the way we talk about experience, but it's their, you know, how comfortable are they? Do you know, do they have the skill sets and have they are they have they honed their skill sets to do the activity or uh you know, have they travelled on that road before? And if they have, then they can share with, with yourself their their experiences and they can give you advice and and obviously guide you through that. And then you've got your twenty percent which is structured learning. So structured learning is important. Uh, but for me, actually learning from others and learning from others' experience is, is absolutely uh, vital. I mean, I know, I know one of the things that, that you're a great believer is enabling people to f- fulfil their, their potential. And, and I, I'm getting the feel from what you, you're saying that uh, perhaps a way of describing potential is actually... It's the ability to learn, it's the willingness to learn, and it's the ability to put what, what, what's been learned um, into practice. I mean, when we talk about potential, I know that because you regard it as so important, there must be uh, many examples of people that you've recruited, perhaps into fairly junior positions, who've gone on to perhaps become senior managers within the business. Um, I mean, is that right? Are there a lot of examples of that? And then can you think of any in particular that, that demonstrate it well? Yeah, there's there's many examples within our organisation as well where we've had individuals that have come in at a fairly uh, junior level and all people that have come in on, a, on work experience, work trials that are now at a, a senior level. For example, we've got a, a chap called Kevin who's part of our management information system uh, team. He's a, a, a very data literate guy. You know, he's he's uh, he's you know, he's our man for telling us where we are on contracts, how we're performing. We we use uh, Kevin and his team is our MIS manager. We use him because he's our single version of the truth. What we find is that when we're looking at contracts and talking to people. They will give their version of events. They'll give they'll give their sort of way of thinking, and and uh, and in some cases, uh, you know, we need independent information. So our management information suite of information, our dashboard, is created by uh, our MIS guy, and he came in as a work trial. So the, it depends on the person's ability to really find the thing that makes them tick, that really they find so easy, and we. Play, you know, again, play to their strengths. You know, once we've once we've got that, then you'll you'll find that, you know, not only does the passion come out, but also their ability to really craft and hone their skills. They're thinking about it day and night. They're really focused on it, and they are, you know, they want to grow, and they, you know, they're taking you along the journey. And and this is, it's really, it's like. You know, you, back in the day when, you, you know, if you're passionate about something, you could spend 10, 12 hours, you know, and I used to spend, you know, hours and hours on, on tape decks, you know, creating, you know, cassettes and so forth because I love doing that. And so you could spend that time very easily because for you it's not work, it's now passion. But as long as you're good at it and if you can craft, if you can put passion al- alongside what you're good at, then that's a res- recipe for you to grow as a person which is what we all want to do. We want to grow as individuals and further and better ourselves in whatever we do. Yeah, pa- passion plus ability obviously is a, a recipe for uh, success. Um, and uh, Within Pathway, you, you, you've you got um, something that I think you call 15 skills. What's that all about? Yeah, these are the traits and skills that we look at when we're not only hiring people, but also in terms of our development and these are skills that our management team looked at in terms of what are the skills for the now, what are the skills for the future. So skills and traits are the other areas that we look at. So digital is one of them. You know, that's a basic for us now. So when we're looking at recruiting, the person needs to be in a position where they're very comfortable with 
being digital online. Um, we need people who are have the willingness. Uh, you know, we're going to be in a position where there's many things we've never done before. That shouldn't be a barrier for us. So if the person, you know, has the view that I've never done this before and they put that as a, as a, as a, as an element of sabotage, then they're self-sabotaging. And we need people who, yeah, they've never done things before, but they've got the ability to to learn things and grow. And we need to do that. There's many tools I've never used before. There's, you know, we, we're now using Microsoft Teams on a daily basis. I've never used Zoom or Teams before. I was always a traditional face-to-face -face person or a telephone person. I've never done Skype before, but, you know, that's not an excuse for me not to do that. You know, I, I, you know we use software like monday.com now for project planning. We use various tools where, you know, we're trying to systemize and that's the culture we've got. So, you know, our culture is very much now trying to be lean, agile, and that is using the tools, the applications that we have. So individuals need to be digital. That's just one. But we also have skills that we look at, which is about problem solving, being in a position that, you know, can they come up with solutions? Are they resilient enough to deal with uh, failure, with knockbacks? I mean, later in the series, we're going to talk more specifically about um, interviews. Um, uh, 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 but so I don't want to get too heavily into that. But I think what I think would be interesting would be to know when you're recruiting somebody, uh, what what is your role? I mean, do, do you tend to be very hands on and get yourself involved? Uh, when most people rejoin the business, uh, sorry, join the business, or, or or do you tend to delegate the the recruitment process to to line managers? How how does that work? I think the first thing is who is the owner of that job. So that that's the key for me. Who you know who owns that job? Who you know, if if is it somebody that's going to be directly reporting to me? Then obviously I'm 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 the person that's going to be line managing. So therefore, it's imperative that I'm part of that process. I don't outsource that or pass that on to anybody else. So I'm part of that process from right at the beginning, in terms of crafting the uh, the, the the role, the need for the role, the the type of person that we're we're looking to seek. Uh, we also, uh, in many cases, particularly at the sort of management level, we create a pack. For the individual as well, so it's not always about this is what we're looking for in terms of traits as a person, but this is information that we give to the individual to say where this is what that job is. So it's a bit more than a job description. It's actually giving them information with regard to the organisation structure. So we share with them the organisation chart with in detail in terms of this is the structure of what we're looking at. We give them, you know, if we need to give them the actual contracts that they're dealing with, we'll give them those contracts, we give them our performance figures so they can come in with their eyes open. Uh, in terms of how, what level of involvement I have, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm quite close to anything to do with recruitment because people are effectively the key people that are going to be driving your business forward and when it goes wrong, in, a, in many cases, it, it go, can go badly wrong as well so you want to get the best opportunity to make you right. It doesn't always work but you want to put focus to make sure that you know you've given it the best that you can. So you do look at culture. You know, so you know we make sure the fact that not only you know, do we look at the the onboarding process, but we look at the whole sort of peer support mentoring process as well, and put a plan in terms of you know ex this is what our expectations are. This is what your first week will, will look like. This is what the first month will look like, and this is first the first ninety days or a hundred days that we'll look at. So, you know, we 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 plan for the first three months in terms of the individual, and we share that with them right at the beginning. Not even even sometimes in some cases before they've offered, been offered the job as well. So we discuss with them what this means, and what we don't want to do is really, particularly when people are coming to us from other organizations leaving a job where they feel that you know it's slightly risky to come to another organization people use the term better the devil you know and sometimes what happens is they have doubts uh, in terms of leaving and so what you want to do is try and eradicate as much of that and give them as much information 
to say, this is what our expectations are. This this is what the contracts are. This is what the figures are. This is only when they've gone through the first, at least first two stages, when you're really serious about, you know, there's a job offer there. So we talk terms before we get somebody in. So at least they're coming in with their eyes open and hopefully they've got some comfort and, and you know, any doubts or any... Uh, niggles that they have in their mind or if there's a voice in their head to say you know am I doing the right thing you know they've got the information and they've got hopefully a gut feel to say yeah this is the right right choice for us so we we don't take it very light you know we don't you know we don't take it lightly yeah you've gone into to authorship and and um you you've written a number of, of books canny bite books about business and, uh, and and in reading those books one of the things that that strikes me is um, just how important you regard teams and the, the team dynamic. So, you know, what do you think makes a good team and, and, and what's the best team that you've ever worked with? In terms of team dynamics, I mean, we, you know, we, you know, you must have heard the saying where together everybody achieves more. You know, that that's something that's uh, that flows of our uh, of our staff on a, on a long, on, a, on many bases, and uh, uh, you know, we work predominantly in smaller teams. We look at very carefully who comes into that team, um, particularly with regard to you know how that team dynamics are, how the how the performance of that team is looked at. And in many cases, we use feedback. Uh, we use sort of 300, 360 degree type level of feedback uh, with regard to um, how how the uh, individuals um, are within the within the team. Um, from my from my perspective, uh, you know, quite simply, a team is a group of people that make each other better. So it's about getting the best out of. Uh, out of each other it's also you know where you're going to be spending most of your time you know we've all we've all heard the saying that you know people don't leave businesses they leave managers i would say that's true but they also leave they also stay because of their team and they also leave because of their team and the people around them as well so it's absolutely vital because that is your environment that's where you're spending most of your time and to get that right it's number one for us. It's not just about our employer brand. It's not just about what uh, our organisation is, as, you know, to, to the outside world. But it's also what that team dynamics are, and you know, does that meet the expectation of what we've sold uh, to to that individual? So, so come on, then. What's the best team? that you've been involved with I'm going to put you on the spot if it's a, I mean the, the current team obviously I, would, I have to start with that so path, Pathway uh, my, my present team we've had, we've had a little bit of a change within the organisation uh, you know of course you're going to say well he will say that anyway because but you know generally that is that is the case so you know from uh, you know we, we've got a number of people uh, uh, that have been with the organisation um, you know in in all, in all cases they've been you know the, the, my close team is exactly the, the people that I work with that I spend most time with you know we've got about 60, 60 directly employed and maybe 40 contractors with Pathway uh, I'll probably spend most of my time with about 8 people um, and, and that's a mixture mix, mixture of uh, people that I've just joined a few months back to individuals that have been there 10 years and I learn from all of them uh, and I've got different relationships with each one and uh, from my perspective, I'm still, I, I feel every single time I meet any one of them, whether it's collectively or individually or collectively, I feel energized and uh, enthusiastic and I and I feel a sense of um, proudness. I was talking um, on one occasion to a naturalist um, and I said to, to this this naturalist i said you know we all know that it's the strong that survive and she said actually adrian that, that that's not the case it's it's not so much the strong that survive it's the adaptable that survive it's the flexible that survive you know the if you look in the natural world you know rats for example um they are incredibly uh, adaptable and they can they can live in all sorts of different circumstances 
Is that true with your um, within a business? The the importance of adaptability and flexibility and uh, being able to be agile. I think the ability, just on on that, the ability to react, adapt, and change is absolutely vital. You know, no, I mean, we're you know we're at the end of you know at the end of the year. You know, at the beginning of the year, we have these uh, plans, these aspirations, uh, you know, resolutions or promises. However, you know, people have moved away from calling them New Year resolutions to New Year promises. I mean, that's the current thing. But you know, you know, you know whatever or you thought hasn't gone to whatever your plans were you know we we know that for some people you know this year has has been a tough year you know i would say that's for quite a lot of people but for some people they've been in a position where they've been their business has been elevated and they're in new territory and they've taken their you know they've with both arms the opportunity as well uh for us it's about seeking the opportunity and seizing the opportunity you need to be in a position where if there is an opportunity are you ready to seize it i've seen many times where people are saying well actually you know i'm not ready just yet if this happens at the you know you know when this happens then this happens and then you know c happens you know a has to happen and b has to happen and c has to happen then i'm ready in some cases the opportunity might pass you by so it's about seizing the opportunity, seizing the day, seizing the moment, being in a position where you're open to it, you're in a position where you can change your mind to the opportunity or you, know, you can see the opportunity. But it's about our awareness. And and that's the first thing, your emotional intelligence to be aware and and then take it from there, really. it's it's That, that for me is absolutely vital in terms of your accurate level of ability to have a self-image image for your organization and then go from there with there's only certain things we can control and you know we can only control what we can control there's things that you can't control and you know we need to focus on the things that we can control and do those better and and really that's one step at a time isn't it that's how how i see it We're coming now to, to, to the close of, of this particular part of our first episode, but what I'd just like to conclude with is just asking you what you think the role for artificial intelligence will be in the future because increasingly we're being told that humans will become redundant in all sorts of functions because clever little machines will be able to take their place, not only in terms of physically being able to do things like stack shelves or pack boxes but in terms of decision making and and I just wonder if you think um, in the future you'll be looking to recruit um, one particular AE program or uh, AI program rather than another instead of an actual living breathing person what, what do you think? I'll tell you one thing, it surprises me in terms of the level of development that's out there. Um, you know, I used to watch Tomorrow's World back in the day and, and, you know, they used to have these themes and, you know, one day we'll have these robots and so forth. And and part of you is thinking, yeah, that's a good thing. And then part of you thinking, you know, you start thinking about the negative as- aspect of it. And with everything, there's pros and cons and, and it, there's some positives and, the, and, and it's really seeing what works for you as an organization what works for the economy um definitely there's no doubt that you know there's certain jobs that are going to be redundant you know overall in terms of the the, the there's le- less uh, need for those particular jobs and there's more jobs that are being created uh in terms of jobs that are for the future we probably don't know some of those jobs we're currently recruiting for more data people data scientists because that's a key thing for us in terms of uh, being able to identify themes, patterns, trends. Um, you know, that's a th- that, that's a key area. We were, you know, from an administration perspective, there's less and less because we're again being lean in terms of our processes, systemization. So you know, we don't necessarily need that many administration staff. So there's a def- definite uh, change that's happening. Um, it's a massive area. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, it's an area that I do take a, a somewhat of interest, more so on the basis of skills for the future, 
uh, and more so in terms of generally, I'm I'm generally interested in terms of what's happening and and, and where we are. But for our perspective, technology, uh, the use of technology, um, even without uh, AI, is is key in terms of systemization uh, and providing that better customer service and better experience for ultimately the customers and ourselves. And if it gives you better experience and it saves time. Uh, you know, generally that's a that's a good thing. Well, uh, that's fascinating stuff. And in the next um, the next broadcast, we're going to be looking at another aspect of of individuals and people within organisations, um, and we'll be talking about about leadership. But unfortunately, we've run out of time. So now comes the time to curtail our canny conversation with the course uh, and to thank uh, people for listening and I hope they'll take the opportunity uh, if they've missed it to catch up at their convenience Thanks for listening to this canny conversation with a cause These conversations are based upon the Canny Bites books by Safraz Ali available on Amazon To find out more go online and visit Saf's website pathwaygroup.co.uk or join him on social media. He can be contacted at safras at pathwaygroup.co.uk.